thanks. Thanks very much for that introduction and for this chance to talk about John Locke. Um, I'm sorry for the way that I'm dressed. Classes don't start until Wednesday at Duke. <laughs> I've been in Central Europe for the last three weeks, and I had to wear a coat and tie every day to give lectures there, so deal with it. <laughs> uh, the question that I pose here at the outset is, requires two pieces of definition, I would expect. One is modern, which I have in kind of quote marks, and the other is economist. And I'm not going to define either of those things. Uh, we may talk about those a little bit in questions, but the, the qualifier modern, I think, is important. And what does it take to be an economist is something that I've tried to work out myself. Uh, I actually never got a job in an economics department. I worked for the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, and then I taught as a visitor at Dartmouth College, but I've been in political science for more than 30 years now. I've never understood the distinction between economics and political science, and I think that John Locke and Adam Smith both might wonder about whether the difference really would hold up. I understand that it benefits faculty, because if you can define your field small enough, you can be one of the top ten members of it. <laughs> and if the field is so small there's only eight, you're golden. You really don't have to do very much. But as far as actually working on real problems, I think that there are political and economic elements. And one of the reasons that Locke is so interesting is that he integrates those so seamlessly. So he's usually credited for when we teach about Locke. We think about his theory of property. We think about the contractarian requirements for legitimate government. But he also made fundamental contributions in epistemology, in theory of mind, in philosophy, kind of a criticism of rationalism and whether human minds come into the world kind of pre-programmed. Is there a ROM BIOS that has an underlying operating system, that, or is, there, is, is it all software? His letter on toleration is remarkable. He wrote on money, theories of the money supply. And if you're interested in John Locke as an economist, I recommend to you Karen Vaughan's wonderful University of Chicago Press book, John Locke, Economist and Social Scientist. But today, we're going to talk about price. I'm going to talk about why price is important and why is it so hard to understand the function of prices in a market economy. Now, I'm not sure it is that hard to understand, but I do know that very few people understand it. So maybe it's just hard to teach, particularly if the teachers themselves don't know it. Now, I was hoping to see my Duke colleague Nancy McLean here today, because <laughs> I know my talk was advertised. I, is Nancy? Well, we, speaking of, of people who don't understand price. So I want to take a step back and think about price and ask this question. There's a normative question. How much should things cost? What is the function of price? Should the state regulate prices or let them find their own level? What are the implications of that? Now, in modern economics, price is a measure of opportunity cost. The simple reason why prices are important is that prices in a competitive market system reflect the opportunity cost of that resource. And opportunity cost means the best alternative use. And that has a normative component. It's a moral mistake for me to use something that someone else values more. It's a moral mistake for me to use something that someone else values more. But how would I know unless there's a price? Price reflects the fact that I may want to use something, or I may want to sell it, or let someone else use it. So suppose that I have an apple, and I value it at $2. You value it at $5. It would be selfish of me to eat that apple, but we would need some way for us to share it in a way that benefits both. But in a market system, and this is so obvious it isn't worth saying, and being a professor, it's the sort of thing I always say, <laughs> if you pay me $3, $3.50, both of us benefit by $1.50. I would take two, but I get $3.50. You'd pay five, but you get it for $3.50. The point is, you should have that apple. And if there's some way of getting that apple from me to you that benefits both of us, 
that's why markets are so important. Every voluntary exchange makes both parties better off. But one of the problems with modern microeconomics is that it focuses on price without talking about the underlying subjective valuations. Almost every transaction reflects a disagreement. Almost every transaction reflects a disagreement. The only reason we would transact is if we disagree about the value. That's why we can agree on a price. These two people disagree about the value of the apple. One thinks it's worth two, one thinks it's worth five. The reason they can agree on a price of 350 is that there's an underlying disagreement. If you start with prices rather than exchange, you're making a mistake. The reason prices are important is they tell us where things should go. Things are in the wrong place. All over the world, all of the time, things are in the wrong place. They're not in their most high, highly valued position. Prices help us move things in that direction. I'm going to show a video now, if it works. And I should note that I weighed about 40 pounds more when I made this video. One of the commenters compared me to Spon uh, Patrick in SpongeBob, the <laughs> pink. Well, if you don't know, it's just as well. <laughs> What's better, knowing the price of something or knowing with perfect information how much something should cost? It's a trick question. Suppose there are two farmers, Al Truis and Mo Cash for me. Each of them has 500 acres of land that could grow either corn or soybeans. Suppose I ask what their plans are. Both of them text back, I don't know. Now suppose we've borrowed a crystal ball from some genie, and we know everything. Among the things the crystal ball can tell us are that Brazil has had a terrible summer with drought and then late floods that wiped out 40% of their soybean crop. It also tells us that new uses for soybean curd have pushed up consumer demand for soy paste all over Asia. Meanwhile, corn crop yields have hit record highs all over the world. And at the same time, several countries ended their corn-based ethanol programs, leading to an extraordinary corn surplus. Our first farmer, Al, has to decide what to plant. Al never wanted anything for himself. All he cares about was doing what was best for all of humanity. He does research, trying to decide which crop will be better for humanity as a whole. But it's hard for Al to determine what information is most relevant because he doesn't trust price information and the knowledge that he needs is too dispersed, too specific, and too hard to learn. Now Al knows a lot, but still not enough. He's stuck at I don't know. So he makes a guess, plants corn. Al's put a tremendous amount of time and resources into his research instead of focusing on what he's good at, running a farm. As a result, he doesn't get much corn planted, has a hard time selling the corn he does produce. He has to sell for very little, and he ends up bankrupt. Let's look at Mo's experience. Since he cares only about profits, he focuses on prices. In early February, the price of corn futures falls sharply. But soy futures indicate that prices for soy delivered in August should be excellent. Why did this happen? Mo has no idea and he couldn't possibly care less. Mo sells a large soy futures contract to lock in the high price and plant soy on every square inch of land that he owns. It's a selfish bet, one that'll make Mo a lot of money. Instead of trying to be an expert in all the disparate subjects he'd need to master, to have perfect information about the marketplace, he just focused time and resources on running his farm. And the only other information he used was prices. So he produced a lot of soybeans and did well for himself. Which of the two did the right thing, the better thing for society? What would the genie with the crystal ball have told us? The genie would have looked at the glut of corn and the shortage of soy that made it so valuable and told us what people need is more soy. But of course, there's no such thing as genies in the real world. Information is too dispersed, too complicated to solve the IDK problem through research. 
there's just too much to know. Fortunately, farmers don't need a crystal ball because prices do exactly what we were hoping that the genie would do. Farmers don't need to know why a price is high or low. And in fact, no single person could possibly explain it fully. But by growing the crop that produces the greater profit, farmers can produce the crop that solves the shortage, meets the demand, and satisfies the requirements of innovation. It's impossible to attain perfect information about the entire marketplace, which is changing all the time. Prices are a way of condensing all that information into one easily understood signal. Almost like magic. <clears throat> now, that was my attempt to explain why price in competitive markets is so important. And there's two parts to it. One is an altruist who wants to do what's good for society will fail without prices. And a selfish person who acts on prices will do what the altruist was trying to do. Both of those are important. You can't do without prices, and with prices in a competitive setting, you can't help but do what's good for society. Those two things together are a really powerful set of arguments. Now, I'm about to show something that got me in trouble a couple of years ago. You may imagine that I sometimes get in trouble. Um, but I went a little bit nuts. In fairness, this was a headline and article from the New York Times business section. So I would claim that they're fair game for criticism on economic grounds. It wasn't, you know, the editorial page, of which I expect very little. <laughs> Does anybody see a problem with that headline? <laughs> they were kind enough to leave the problematic word uncapitalized. So first, there's this terrible thing that's happened. Bird flu, send, bird flu sends egg prices up. And then, completely unrelated, fortunately, slowing demand prevents shortages. <laughs> Who would have thought? So with, without the but, actually they could have just stopped with bird, bird flu sends egg prices up. Because the point is, if prices are free to adjust, there can never be a shortage of anything. Prices are free to adjust, we can never run out of anything. And the reason is, three things happen. High prices lead consumers to look for alternatives and substitutes. Anticipating the high price, producers try to find a way to increase output. And if we see actual high prices, entrepreneurs will try to invent substitutes. Over and over again, we hear something about peak oil, peak all sorts of things, and the response is people use less, we make more, and we find substitutes. So it's literally impossible to run out of anything as long as prices are free to adjust. Now there are circumstances when prices are not free to adjust, and of course, that's when we run out of things. So does thinking that way make you a bad person? I am assured by my colleagues that it does. <laughs> and I mean assured, they're, they're pretty convinced. Well. Let me step back for a moment. What's the problem about using price to allocate things that people really need? And I think many of us have moral intuitions that are shaped by our evolutionary, by our evolutionary backgrounds. Evolution by natural selection will select brain modules whose function facilitated, at least in the past tense, reproduction in historical time. Now, 10,000 years ago, we didn't have any kind of well-developed market system or system of trade that we could rely on to provide things for us in an emergency. And 10,000 years is not a very long time in evolutionary time. That is, our brains are evolved for a setting where markets were something that didn't really exist. Now, through the application of reason, we may be able to figure out why it is that price is important. And that was the enterprise in which Locke was engaged in the piece of paper that you have in front of you that's handwritten. That's actually from the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Uh, it's literally a photocopy, but that's Locke's actual handwriting. This was found in a, on fool's cap in a uh, folio, just a, basically a file in 1691. 
And it was Locke's reflection on this question. When is the market price just? That is, when should our reason be able to overcome our lizard brains, which are evolved to think that price is always unjust? I mean, if I need something, if I need something, if I'm starving or I need water, you should give it to me. Because we live in small clan groups of 120 people or so, and we depend on each other in that family. That's a different sort of set of relationships. If I need something and you have it, you should give it to me. The question is, under what circumstances can we suspend that very strong moral architecture that's built into the way that we react to these problems? So it's likely that market institutions have evolved faster than the brain modules that react to market processes. That is, our brains may be atavistic. Now, an atavism, you probably know, this, I, I, this is Hayek's word, but it's also used in uh, biology. Whales have hips. They don't have legs. They haven't had legs for millions of years, but they have hips. So whales, because they are evolved from creatures that had legs and either lived on land or in shallow water, still have atavistic hips. Now, their neutral buoyancy, they don't pay any penalty. There's no external protrusion here that would slow them down. So there's no evolutionary problem with having hips. But they still have these atavisms. And it's interesting that most species of whales still have some kind of atavistic hips are the moral intuitions that we have about price atavisms. Well, suppose you see a violation of the rules. Your body is immediately suffused with a cocktail of chemicals that cause you to provide the public good of norm enforcement. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. When I lived in Germany in 2009, I was teaching at Erlangen, a small, uh, Frederick Alexander University, a small university uh, near Nuremberg. I was visiting Munich, and I'm from North Carolina. We don't really, if you're walking, you don't take street signals, red and green, very seriously. So I walked up to a pretty busy intersection and pushed my way through a crowd of children. <laughs> I, I didn't really think much about it. And I looked both ways, and there's no cars coming. And so I started walking across the street. And then I felt a sharp pain in my elbow, and this little tiny Uber Oma is shouting at me, Kinder Mortar, Kinder Mortar, you child murderer. If the children see you cross against the light, the very fabric of society will be ripped asunder. This cannot be allowed. Now, I probably could have taken her. <laughs> I mean, the, the emotions. The, the chemicals in her brain caused an 80-year-old woman to attack a full-grown adult male. This, in biological terms, is probably not adaptive. <laughs> Except that it was, because what was my reaction? I immediately tried to make myself physically smaller. I was ashamed. I went back. I apologized. I told the children, don't do this. So both of us had a reaction to a violation of the norms. When the norm was pointed out, I had a shame reaction. So in some ways, maybe we can't do without. Not being the autistic homo economicus caricature is something that when you look at Locke or Adam Smith, much of what we depend about people's reaction of sympathy, our basic cooperation, that's been stripped out of modern neoclassical economics. But it doesn't have to be. We need to take account of human beings as they actually are. However, you also have probably had the experience, particularly if, you're, if you have the poison called testosterone in you, of being cut off in traffic. And you think, oh, hell no, you're not disrespecting me. Sometimes five minutes after I've been cut off in traffic, my wife will say, you're still trying to get that guy, aren't you? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. That's so stupid. Why would you do that? Well, the, the thing about having an involuntary response is, it is, say it with me, not voluntary. This is an evolved response. It's not something we have control over. Are our reactions to prices something like that? 
Well, the very idea of allowing other people to use markets to commodify things, sometimes when these acts are repugnant, may induce response, disgust. So, two people go out to dinner, someone buys a dinner, a show, jewelry, and they have sex, that's okay. But if you actually try to pay money, that's not okay, that's prostitution. Well, it's an interesting distinction, but this is, this is something that I think is pretty important. Notice, though, no one's saying that it was not okay for them to have sex. What was not okay is to use the price mechanism. The thing is okay. What's not okay is to use the price mechanism. Suppose that I donate a kidney and it saves the life of someone. My name and picture in the newspaper. Good person saves other person by donating kidney. Suppose instead I sell my kidney. Well, again, I'm in the newspaper. Giant asshat <laughs> sells kidney. Well, the point is that either way, the kidney went from a lower vi value to a higher valued use, a very substantially higher valued use. We don't talk about the kidneys that don't make that move because we don't allow the price mechanism to operate. The unseen part of that is very difficult for us to take into account. So markets are institutions for reducing the transactions cost of impersonal exchange. The core argument for markets then is that voluntary exchange makes both parties better off. The public policy implication is that the state should take only minimal actions to regulate voluntary exchange, and those actions should foster exchange. So the problem that I think we have is we have lifeboat mines. That is, it's as if we're in a small boat out at sea, and if I have water and you don't, we're not going to get any more. The supply elasticity is zero. This is all we've got. And so we're going to allocate just what we have. Under those circumstances, the price mechanism is pretty iffy. I have water, you don't. You say, will you share your water? You have plenty. I say, yes, and what I would like to have is the present value of your life and that of your children, because that's the most you would pay. I'm an economist, and I figured this out. Next thing I know, I'm swimming. <laughs> and you have the water. <laughs> so we have the sense, and probably not many juries would convict him. Why'd you kill him? He tried to sell us water. Oh, no. Because there's no way of using the price mechanism to get more. But we live in a Walmart world where the supply elasticities are very impressive. We live in global markets. So we have lifeboat mines, but we live in a Walmart world. And that's the reason why Locke's insights and the venditio are so important. <coughs> in the Raleigh newspaper, there's, uh, it's getting shorter and shorter, but there's still one page in the funnies, uh, where there's Leo. And notice that Leo is in, he's in outer space. He crash lands, and there's a space alien there. Space suit's $25 because you can't hold your breath forever. Is the space alien acting badly? Everyone who looks at this says yes. Well, if the space alien caused the crash, yes. And don't ask why he could breathe in outer space but not on the moon. It's a cartoon. <laughs> I've had people read, no, why can't he breathe? But suppose the space alien has been there for four or five days. This is the first crash. There are examples that are actually quite like this. I was hiking when I was in Germany with my friend in the Bavarian forest. And we'd gotten up about 9 o'clock. We'd started hiking about 10 in the morning. And we were thoroughly lost. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. At about 2 o'clock, we started to ask for directions, but being men, we didn't because one doesn't do that. And then by 3 o'clock, there were neither path nor other walkers. So we were pretty far away from everything. Roy's phone's going off. About 3 o'clock, having hiked now for about five hours, we saw Mirabile Dictu, a hut. 
And we go over, and the hut is selling sandwiches and beer. Now, the beer was 12 euros, and the sandwich was 20 euros. I said, I would like one of each of those, please. And I'm glad you're here. My German friend sat on the front steps and pouted. <laughs> it should not be allowed that they charge such high prices. What the hell? Five minutes ago, we didn't have a choice. You are now being offered a voluntary option you didn't have. And you're mad because you want yet a third alternative that doesn't exist. There's no other people around. There's nobody here in this hut. So I got another beer just to piss him off. <laughs> I offered him some, and he said, no, I have principles unlike you. <laughs> no, you're just hungry, sweetie. <laughs> but we really have a very strong moral intuition, one that we will even give up harm to ourselves to punish. He saw himself as punishing these terrible people that were operating this tiny hut and had no other customers except us, and probably were about breaking even. He actually would have preferred a state regulation keeping the price low enough that the hut would have had to close. Which brings us to Hurricane Fran in 1996. This is an example many of you have heard, but I added it back in because of events in Texas. So this audience knows enough about those events. Uh, by the time Fran passed through, much of Raleigh was without power. There are trees down across many of the roads. <clears throat> Three young men in Goldsboro. And I, I, I've given this a version of this talk a number of places. Those are all the synonyms that I can find for rednecks. <laughs> Some from Latin America. So these young men who lived in Goldsboro uh, the, the storm's path had been predicted to pass through Goldsboro, and so there were a lot of prepositioned supplies there. There were there's ice, things that were needed in Raleigh, and so what they decided was that they would rent refrigerator trucks and buy a lot of ice at $1.50 a bag and take it to Raleigh. And when they got there, they set up not far from here at the Five Points area and near NC State, and they started selling ice. And they were selling ice at $1.50 a bag? No they were selling ice at $11 a bag. And a line formed. Enough people wanted to buy ice that a line formed. Now, you may have been at parties like this. It's always a party until the police show up. <laughs> Why did the police show up? Because North Carolina, here, yeah, because they needed ice. North Carolina, like 34 other American states, has an anti-gouging law. All anti-gouging laws have three parts. The first is the trigger, which is the declaration of a state of emergency. The second is the domain, the set of things, which is pretty much anything that you need in an emergency. And the most interesting, I think, is the limit. Does anybody see the limit in North Carolina's anti-gouging law? That is, how much can you raise something in the domain if the trigger has been met? And the answer is that the price cannot be unreasonably excessive under the circumstances. It can be unreasonable. It can be excessive. But it cannot be unreasonably excessive. <laughs> this is, I mean, a number of y'all work with the legislature. You know that sort of precision in language is their hallmark. <laughs> but there is a precise interpretation, which, and it's 5%. Because apparently the price last week was given to us by so you can't raise price of commodities within the domain under the trigger by more than 5%. Now, what is the effect of that? <laughs> well, what happened to the young men was that they were arrested, handcuffed, the trucks were impounded, taken to the police impound lot, turned off, and all the ice melted. Now, here's my question. And it, this is a serious question. If you were standing in line, what, you, what would you have done? Told the police to stop. Yeah, but you're, got like 11 bucks. sweetie, sweetie, you're special. <laughs> less, less special people would not have that reaction. They're more like my German friend. What did they do? 
They clapped. Yeah. yeah. They went without ice, just like my German friend went without a sandwich and beer. What happened, though, was that bad people were punished. Because their stupid lizard brains cannot overcome this notion that this ice had been brought from somewhere else. The ice had been brought from somewhere else because the high price signaled that it was more valuable in Raleigh than it was in Goldsboro. Now, I don't mean in any way to demean Raleigh's finest, but I doubt that the police needed a calculator to know that $11 was more than 5% more than $1.50. <laughs> but if you take that price seriously, the 5% is not enough to induce anybody to buy ice in Goldsboro and bring it to Raleigh. So they clapped. Now, it took me five years to understand this. At first, I just decided that people were dumb. And I have to admit, there is a problem with economists. Economists generally assume that human beings are rational, except when they disagree with economists. <laughs> then people are stupid. They're just not rational. Well, this isn't necessarily an irrational reaction if you're a subjectivist and you believe in trade-offs. People might value the moral qualities of the exchange more than the material benefit of getting the ice. And if you think in terms of consumer surplus, maybe I only would have paid $12 at most. The $11 had gotten rid of most of the consumer surplus. What mattered was that I saw that justice would be done. So while it's not irrational, I think the story is the moral outrage, the strong negative effect of being taken advantage of in the lifeboat, overwhelmed the expectation of the material benefit from consummating the exchange for ice. Here's what I think is interesting. Consider two people. A guy watching TV in Goldsboro who feels bad for Raleigh. He tells his partner, man, I feel bad. What's for lunch? And I wonder what's on SportsCenter. Or a guy who rents a truck, buys ice, drives it to Raleigh, sells, this is sort of a Game of Thrones thing, because a, 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 a uh, omniscient benevolent social planner would whisper in the ears of people, take ice to the beleaguered city. They, sh they should. Yeah, but what I'm saying is the law crippled that. The fact is, we think B is less moral. Why? And the answer is, we think there's a C. There should be someone who takes the ice for free. I got a question. Would it have been illegal for these guys to auction this? Yes. Really? Yes. Even if they had receipts. Yes. Even if they had receipts. So suppose that the auction had taken place in Goldsboro and they'd yeah. bought it. Well, but the, the, even if they had a receipt saying they had paid more than 5% more. Yeah, the people buying it in Raleigh. I understand. Meeting, well, of, of course that would be illegal. That's just some subterfuge. That's typical of you. <laughs> some Jesuitical trick to get around it. <laughs> no, you're, 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 you're an exception, my friend. So, the, yes. The, 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 <laughs> yeah, I've, I, 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 just, I just want to pick fights with Duke people. So I hurried through that so that I could get to the reading from Locke, who asked the question, what is the just price? And his answer is, the market price is always just. But when would a moral person be justified in making his own market price? So what is prohibited, allowed, or permitted in venditio. And the reason that this context matters is I saw an interview today with the Texas Attorney General who has pledged that he will spend a lot of resources making sure that desperate Texans are prevented by men with guns from buying stuff that they need. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> Well, but a, a lot of men and women with guns are going to surround people who are trying to sell stuff and make sure that they can't sell it. Now, again, in Game of Thrones terms, what would this be? It would be called a siege. 
when, military, when the military is used to prevent desperate people from getting stuff they need, that's a siege. If a foreign army did it, it would be an act of war. But when our police do it, it's just public policy. So it's actually pretty remarkable that we, in a time of such desperate need, devote a lot of our resources to making sure that people are not allowed to sell stuff that people need. But that's the nature of price gouging. So when is the price just? And Locke's answer is the market price is always just. Now this is quite a short little reading, but he has four examples in it that are fascinating. So if there's many buyers and many sellers, and no one can much influence, the buyer, if the buyer seller has enough market power to set the price, you must act as if he cannot. But there's an artificial or fictitious bargain can take account of other factors such as opportunity cost. So it's a brilliant argument, in fact. It's very modern. It's very economistic. So I, I think it's a little bit surprising that nearly 100 years before Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations, because Smith's notion of price and marginality, this marginality claim that really we, we well, the Carl Menger and uh, Alfred Marshall in the 19th century are where, we, we, where the people we associate that with. Locke came up with it in 1690. The first example is suppose that in year one, wheat can be sold at 10 shillings per bushel. Now in year two, the price has risen to 20 shillings per bushel. Am I justified in selling it at the new market price? Well, of course, people need it more. And if I tried to sell it at last year's price, which was apparently given by God, then the first person that I encountered would just buy all of it and then resell it at the market price. So he understands that secondary markets are a pretty practical problem, even if for some reason you think that this price was given a long time ago. And then second, the second example is of a horse. So I have a horse I really value. My neighbor comes and said, hey, nice horse. And I said, yes, I really value him. The neighbor says, tell you what, I want to buy the horse. No, he's not for sale. I want to buy the horse. Give me a price. He's not for sale. I want to buy him. All right. I'll tell you what. 30 pounds. 30 pounds? That's a fortune. There's no way. I told you he wasn't for sale. Shut up. <laughs> so my neighbor leaves in a huff. I'm bringing along my horse saying, man, I like this horse. I'm glad I didn't sell him. And I see a cart that's tipping over into the river. And the horse that was pulling the cart has died. The cart is full of at least a thousand pounds worth of valuable cargo that will be ruined if it falls into the river. The guy says, for the love of God, sell me your horse. Now, can I say, okay, for 900 pounds? We've already established that I'm willing, in fact, happy to sell the horse for 30 pounds. Now, there's no market here. There's not many buyers and many sellers. So what Locke says is, no, you can only sell it for 30 pounds. You cannot use your knowledge of the, despera of the desperation of the buyer against him and to be a moral person. He's not claiming that this is a public policy matter, but to use the desperation of the person is something more. Now, whether that claim is right or not, it's an interesting one because you're constructing a fictitious bargain. Suppose that I did not know that this person is desperate. Well, I already know that I'd be happy to sell the horse for $30. It's probably worth something like 12. So I'd really be happy to sell it for 30. I can't use my knowledge of the desperation of this person against him. Then a merchant in Danzig, I'm sure Professor Stadden knows three or four dirty limericks that start with there once was a lady of Danzig. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't go into that. <laughs> so in, in Danzig, there is a shipload of wheat. And I'm trying to decide whether to send it to Ostend or to Dunkirk. Now, in Ostend, there is normal conditions, and it's worth 10 shillings a bushel. But in Dunkirk, there is, in Locke's words, almost a famine. And it's $20, 20 shillings a bushel. Two questions. Where should I send the ship? And second, what price am I allowed to charge? 
Well, it would be an odd rule that says, no, you can't send it to Dunkirk just because you know they need it more. That would be perverse. I'm sure I have colleagues at Duke who believe that. You're just using your knowledge of the desperate need not to send it to them. Well, the price is signaling that it's needed more in Dunkirk than it is in Ostend. So, okay, we'll send the ship to Dunkirk where there is almost a famine. Question is, what price can I charge? Because I'm using my knowledge of the desperation of their need, except that there is a market price in Dunkirk. Things are transacting at 20 shillings a bushel. It's not like the horse example, because I would sell to anyone in Dunkirk. I'm not using my knowledge of the desperation of an individual. I'm using the market price as a signal of where I should take it and how much I can charge. Fourth example is more complicated. And well, I, I will go through it very quickly so we have at least a couple minutes for questions. A ship at sea that has an anchor to spare meets another which has lost all her anchors. What here shall be the just price that she shall sell her anchor to the distressed ship? So you have one ship that's lost all of her anchors. And this is the 17th century. Not having anchors is really bad because you'll hit, you go ashore, you can't stay in one place at night. It's almost certainly a death sentence. So not having anchors is really bad. That's why most ships have several anchors. So I have several. I have three or four. He has none. <coughs> to this I answer the same price that she would sell the same anchor to a ship that was not in that distress. For that still is the market rate for which one would part with anything to anybody who was not in distress and absolute want of it. So. Now, with the horse example, we had contrived to make me already decide it was worth 30 before I encounter the new situation. Here, he's saying, you have to perform that calculation yourself. Suppose this person were not in desperate need. Now, I think there's a problem with this. Suppose I say, I wouldn't part for it for less than 500 pounds, because I really need all the anchors that I have. And this guy wouldn't pay more than 300 if he already had one. Well, that means I won't sell it to him because I don't want to take advantage of him. And I tell him this, look, I'm sorry, I know you'll pay 1,000, but you're only doing that because you're desperate. So I'm sorry I can't take advantage of you this way. What the hell? <laughs> so you, you actually see this kind of logic all the time. I torment Duke students with it often. Duke students wear Duke on almost everything, visible and invisible, things, stuff you can't see, underclothing. But it's bad that some of this stuff is manufactured in sweatshops. And so I say, ah, congratulations, my Duke students, because I know what you should do. You should go over to this sweatshop and say, I am the great white man, and I'm here to save you. You're all fired. <laughs> No, no, don't thank me. Well, they won't thank you. Because <laughs> that's actually the best job that they can get. So it, it's not clear how you're benefiting them by harming them and saying, no, you can't have this job. It's not clear how you're benefiting the guy who desperately needs an anchor by saying, well, you would only pay 300. So there's a problem with the application of this logic in really desperate situations. But I think what's interesting about it is that Locke recognized that the, the, the market prices under competition with many buyers and many sellers reflect opportunity cost of resources in ways that otherwise we wouldn't be able to get. So in this case, the master of the vessel must make his estimate by the length of the voyage, the season, and so on. He might not part with it at any rate, but if he would, he must then take no more for it from a ship in distress than he would from any other. So let me just say this. The measure of rating, this is the last paragraph of Venditio. The measure of rating anything in selling is the market price where the thing is sold, whereby it is evident that a thing may be lawfully sold for 10, 20, nay, cent per cent, and 10 times more in one place than in the marketplace in another place, another place perhaps not far off. These are my extemporary thoughts concerning this matter. He's basically intuited Hayek's notion of the particular information about time and place. 
price is going to differ, and that's actually why price is useful, precisely because it differs about the particular in time and place. You can get some pretty fine-grained distinctions about where resources should be moved. And I'm afraid that it would have been better if many of the public officials of the state of Texas had read Venditio rather than whatever they read in law school. Thank you. <laughs>